Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful. And for the faithful, I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal. Do not adjust your set while we are adjusting <laughs> ours. And I'm here today with Bruce McCurdy. Hey, Bruce. Hey, David. How are you doing today? Uh, it's been a long, busy day. Oh, that's ever. I'm trying to clean the house while also yeah. posting stories on the Cult of Hockey website. Yeah. And we've, we've all three of us, me, you, and Kurt, pitched in. <laughs> Multiple we got stories her done so each. Far. Yeah, I like got her done. a lot of posts. There were a lot of posts. There were many, many posts. Hmm. Many posts. Bruce, let's uh, go through just the, there was many changes on the Oilers roster. Some of them good. Some of them questionable. Especially with some fans, they're not too happy. Yep. Some fans are never too happy. Yep. All right. <laughs> We'll, we'll do the first uh, three, which are kind of trades, kind of similar player or somewhat similar player, similar um, slot in the lineup in, similar slot in the lineup out. How about that to phrase it? Sure. Let's start with the, the top line item, which is a change in the top six. This is the most important change they've made so far. It's the only change in what we call the core 12. Right. The core 12 being the top um, two lines the third line center and the top 4D and your top goalie. NHL teams, Rich Winter said a long time ago now, a decade ago, are built around the core 12. I think he's right. I think mm-hmm. that you need, and it's all about getting an outstanding core 12. And I'm going to suggest the orders are about one brick shy of a load at this point, but we'll get into that in a moment. Right now, first change in the core 12 Victor Arvidsson in from the Los Angeles Kings, two-year deal at $4 million a year. Um, he got a good recommendation about Edmonton from Eckholm and Adam Larson, which was really interesting. And um, out, Warren Fogel, a um, hardworking member of the Edmonton Oilers for three years, worked his bag off, as he told us, and he did. He really did work hard. And for the, in, in the regular season, the last year and a half, outstanding hockey player for the Empton Oilers, a two-way hockey player, at least good. Outstanding might be a little bit of an overstatement. Bruce, what's your take on the, on the, on the, uh, on this kind of trade with Fogel going to LA three years at what? Three, 3.5. Was it three times 3.5 for Fogel two times four for Arvidsson. So the orders actually had to take a little bigger bite, but for only two years, uh, I really like the term of the Arvidsson deal. I, I'm not a fan of getting into four and five and seven years for guys that are already in their 30s, but I don't mind two-year terms. Give the guy, you know, a little, little, um, little time to get acclimated and into the team, and you know, then it's not a problem. You have to worry about already in one year to replace them. Yeah. Uh, so two years is just about perfect. Four million is. Pretty reasonable for the guy. He's, uh, it's actually a little cut and pay for him. He's coming off a seven-year contract that uh, paid him 4.25. And, of course, that would be in 2017 dollars, turns against that the cap that was in place at that time. So he's taking a little bit of a haircut. Uh, but to arrive in a pretty good place against a team that he knows pretty well, having knocked his team, Los Angeles Kings, out of the playoffs the last three years in a row. And uh, uh, before that, he was a Nashville predator and a a teammate and apparently close friend of Matthias Eckholm. Uh, For what difference that makes, other than he'll, you know, he'll feel welcome here right from the start, I would have to imagine. He's a very fine player, David. Uh, he always catches my eye. He's just so tenacious on the puck. He's not a banger. He's not a big guy. He's only listed as 5'10", 185. Uh, but he's just one of those guys. Uh, he's a dog on the bone when you get the, get the puck along the boards. And man, oh man, does he win a lot of puck battles. He was just, I thought, terrific in the in the five game series against the Kings. I thought he really was one of the the best Kings and he fought to the bitter end, fought, fought hard right to the bitter end. Uh, and uh, he's got some real skill to back that up. Like his average, uh, he scores two points every three games over his career. That's a 55 point per season guy. And I don't think any of that 
has been playing with the center of the caliber of Leon Dreisaitl, with whom he projects to play on the Oilers. You know, the last uh, three years, he's been on a pretty steady, pretty fantastic, honestly, uh, two-way line with uh, with uh, Trevor Moore and Philip Dano. And uh, the three of them, I mean, none of them is big, but uh, man, that is one, uh, one fine line. Now, Dano and Dreisaitl are two very different players, so there's going to be some uh, adjustment involved from uh, uh, from Arvidsson. But, you know, this is a guy who's averaged 27 goals a year, and he doesn't particularly lean on power play production, which is a good thing because he likely won't make Edmonton's first unit. Uh, he's more of an even-strength guy, and... Uh, uh, he, uh, as long as he can stay healthy, which is a huge question mark with this guy. He's been in the league for nine years, and he's played in that time 540 games, 60 a year. And most of those years, the league has played 82. So he's had this year. He only played 18 games, got 15 points, pretty good. Was healthy at the end. Was healthy in the playoffs, but you know he. Uh, he got banged up, so that is the big risk. He's a little guy playing a big man's game. Yeah, he missed significant time in back injury this year. 2018, 19, mm-hmm. 2019, 20, mm-hmm. 21, 22, and then even mostly this year was the real year. So that's one other good thing about the two-year deal yeah. with a player with a fairly significant mm-hmm. injury history. Although sometimes you see Bruce guys turn the corner on injury too and start to start to start to get it going and sometimes they just fall off a cliff. So if this is a fall off the cliff situation, it's just a two year deal, which is a heck of a lot better than like a six, seven year deal. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, his points per 60 at even strength this year was, I think, about two, two a game. Just the same as another player they're apparently going after right now, Jeff Skinner, the free agent uh, bought out from Buffalo. Um, Warren Fogle was at 2.2 per game this year. This year, yeah. And the guy who signed in Vancouver for seven years at five and a half, is that what it was, Jake DeBrusque? Yeah. Something like that, close to that, seven years at five and a half. He was at 1.5 points per 60, which was lower than Ryan McLeod. Mm-hmm. So, and I know um, one year of points per 60 can be misleading. Uh, points totals um, can be inflated or deflated over a year, depending on the scoring percentage of, depending on essentially puck luck and whether you're up against a hot goalie or not. It's easier to be five or 10 points up or five or 10 points down based on that. And of course, then there's also the even strength issue, which you've already addressed with Arvidsson. But I was just reciting even strength points there. And he's been, that's a pretty, uh, that's that's tops. Anything, if you're up above 0.1.8, actually points per 60, um, in a season, you, that's top six production in the NHL, and and Arvidsson clearly met that uh, met that baseline. He doesn't take a lot of penalty minutes. Eh? Like for his, uh, and I'm like you, Bruce. When I see the Kings play, there's a couple players who stand out. Like Drew Doughty stands out. And Michael Mikey Anderson always stands out because he's aggressive and nasty. Um, you like the Trevor Moore guys, do you? Trevor Moore. <laughs> And well, they just stand out because you know. No, you know, well, I've got a few of them, but yes, Trevor I Moore agree and on all counts. Trevor Moore and Arvidsson stand out because they're really good with the puck, mm-hmm. and they're really super aggressive. So I just, I, I really like this player. Mm-hmm. If he's healthy, I do think probably in the playoffs he'll be more of an impact player than Warren Fogle. Although Warren Fogle in the Stanley Cup Final was okay, he was pretty good. He scored some big made some big plays and um, his speed really started to come into, to be a factor. You can't, you can't be slow in the NHL. I don't think Arvidsson's, um, he's pretty fast and he's pretty agile out there. I, I, like, I can't say for sure that he's as fast as Fogel, but I think he might be similar in terms of speed, uh, but he's, he's much higher in obvious aggression way higher in obvious aggression and stick to itiveness. So we'll see what happens with him. Um, he may play with dry settle. He play, you know, we'll see. Maybe he plays with McDavid. You just never know, right? Like the, the, the lines are so um, fluid, but he's this top six player for sure on the Edmonton Oilers. And um, so um, th- that's a big addition. I, I think he's an improvement over Fogel. 
and the money was the term at least is really good and the money's pretty good so this is a this strikes me as a stanley cup discount contract bruce and the final thing i want to say is it was interesting to hear him shout out to adam larson saying how well adam larson speak to the city speak of edmonton because um spoke of edmonton because it was you know larson decided to leave here and he left here for what he said was personal reasons and you always kind of wonder is that the truth or did you just not like it here and little old cold isolated edmonton but it sounds like he really liked it he really liked the life in edmonton and he arvidson mentioned that how larson spoke well of the city so that was interesting to hear that's a glad nice. adam doesn't have any grudges i mean he does have a personal situation which uh is uh pretty close to home like his dad came to visit him while he was playing here and then his dad had i believe a heart attack and died yeah. while he was in edmonton and and you know adam couldn't disconnect the two and uh so what he played out his contract but when he was finished with it he moved on and he explained that was you know big part of his rationale and you have to well i have to respect that i hope you do as well listeners <laughs> I couldn't believe when the Kings got Arvidsson actually from the Predators. It just drove me crazy. Like, how did they get this really good player? And they just gave up hardly gave like a second round draft. A second and a third. So they gave up drove know, me some, crazy. Va some draft value. But uh, I think uh, I think he'd had two two seasons in a row. Two iffy years. Up. And so yeah. they just thought we've we've uh, got to move on. Good. So. Well, now we got him. Okay, now, let's look at the next one. Look so. at the next kind of trade, Bruce. Mm -hmm. And this one's got a lot of attention, mainly because of the person leaving out of town. And of course, none of these are trades. These are just replacing players in the same role in the lineup. This is six, seven defensemen um, out. Vincent DeHarnay signed a, a two-year deal at $2 million a year in Vancouver. Congratulations, Vincent DeHarnay, on signing a big money NHL contract that is fantastic for you and uh you know from where you came from to where you you got that is just it's great um as a fan of your of your style of game and your dedication to hockey and your attitude great to see you cash in the owner signed a big guy six five two I don't know what 220 230 Josh Brown who played uh against Connor McDavid and Chris Knobloch in the AHL he played with the a very fierce uh, kind of Florida Panthers like Ottawa Generals team in the playoffs, I think in <laughs> 2014 or 2015, that eliminated yes. McDavid's team from the playoffs. Yep. Josh Brown was a, re a hell of a junior hockey player. He's been kind of he bumped around the NHL. He's a career minor leaguer. He's, he played quite a bit last year. Um, he played 51 games in Arizona last year, but he was like the eighth defenseman for Tom on Ice at even strength even strength and at um, shorthanded, he was the fifth most. He played two minutes a game when he got into games at shorthanded. So he was called upon um, shorthanded. Whereas I would say on this one, um, it's a it's a tough one and I understand why people are upset. Vinny DeHarnay, um, his, his story really grabbed people. He captured the imagination of Oilers fans. His whole thing, you know, his high five with Skinner after wins um was was uh people love that there was something about him that, that that drew people to him he was this you know the 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 gentle giant off the ice who was ferocious on the ice when he first came to the team his ferocity impressed a lot of the people then he became a super solid player on the on the penalty kill um and he gradually worked his way up and when he played with brett kulak this year Vinny deharnay was was good he was a good third pairing defenseman with Brett Kulak. So much so that most owner fans were, ex, you know, were getting their heads around a long-term contract for him if it was a value contract. That all came apart, I think, in the playoffs this year. A couple things happened. First, he, um, he struggled moving the puck. He really did. In the intense playoff games under intense forechecking, he struggled to move the puck. And it was a particular problem because then you had him and Cody CC on the right side, two guys who struggle to move the puck, not great puck movers, and CC being weaker than uh, Daharney being weaker than CC, considerably weaker than CC, I'd suggest, to the point where like he was, he just wasn't like making plays. The puck would come into him in the offensive end, and it's a 
nothing's going to happen. And he was struggling to get it out of his own zone. So he was replaced in the lineup by Philip Broberg, a, a move that really worked out well. He His game really fell apart in the playoffs so after he was put with Darnell Nurse, just like a lot of defensemen did this year in the playoffs. And I think there might be some, <laughs> I mentioned this before on the podcast, maybe some hard feelings from, from some of these D-men about Nurse's defensive slump that caused them some trouble, right? Like if your partner's struggling and looking bad and playing poorly, that reflects on you. And it did on CeCe and it did on DeHarnay. And I think both of them um, were in his shadow, frankly, in the playoffs. The final thing is, partly because power plays are less plentiful, but even because in the playoffs, um, but also because after he left the lineup, there was really no change in the Oilers' penalty killing efficiency. And that was, I think, his main calling card was that he could kill penalties. But when he was taken out, they didn't skip a beat. They just kept killing penalties like crazy. (laughs) So it's like, do we really, how, you know, how much do we need him? Because if that's the main reason he was in your lineup, and I'll suggest it was that in physicality, great big guy. Um, Could you just get another big guy who could hang in there now and then on the, and, and promote Broberg, keep that promotion full time. And um, if you hope, maybe hold on to CC, you have to. He's got another year. If you can't move that contract, I think if they've been able to move the CC contract, they may be able to keep DeHarnay. They were unable to, so far, unable to move the CC contract. But I don't think in the end, um, Vinny DeHarnay was a top four D man. And I don't think the orders could afford or should pay $2 million a year for a third pairing D man. So this, this could be a win win for Vincent DeHarnay and the Edmonton Oilers, him moving on. Because it wasn't going to work for him on the orders at that amount, of, that cap hit, and it, then he gets a big payday. He'll be a third pairing in Vancouver too, though, surely. And he, he will. They, they, maybe they, they can, can afford, afford it. They can afford it differently. They lost the door off Bruce, so they they need yeah. that. They need you know that's a huge hole in their lineup. Literally. Thank goodness the door off signed in the Eastern Conference, and we'll play yeah. maybe against Florida in mm-hmm. the first round. That made me really, that's one of the things that made me happiest today was the door off signing and the conference away from the employers because that guy hurt people. Yeah, yes. Yeah, well, Vinny's not a, he's not a, a um, guy that, I mean, he plays a physical game, not as physical. Uh, he's more of a contained guy, really, than anything. Uh, but um, uh, uh, he plays at a high level and he was still, you know, improving deep into the season before he busted his finger in a fight. And then he got low bridged by the previously mentioned Trevor Moore in the uh, uh, game one of the playoffs. And that crimped his style plenty too. And of course, you never know exactly how much they don't tell you. But uh, uh, I do know that uh, he was considered pretty highly by um, uh, some of the... um, analytics style websites i mean jay fresh for example had him listed as uh 59 percent uh 59 percentile in wins above replacement which is kind of their their magic number whereas the incoming josh brown was listed at wait for it zero percent uh meanwhile my distant cousin micah blake mccurdy another analytics whiz has posted a chart with uh, um, showing the play of the puck in the two zones when he's out there. And he says, Joshua Brown, who signed three years times one million in Edmonton, is, in fact, the worst player in the National Hockey League, was his conclusion. I mean, that's when you, when you it's not one of <laughs> the worst. So I'm a little bit uh, nonplussed by that. And uh, then he posted another chart saying, uh, Micah, do you feel sure about that? And the answer is yes. And it shows this line declining actually below the bar and right off the chart for his play over the recent few years with Arizona Coyotes. You know, he's a classic coyote. And Bruce Kerlock, he had a a third um, uh, fellow whose opinion I deeply respect, uh, he said that, uh, and he follows um, 
you know, he follows the Oilers deep down into their own system. He said Michael Kesselring replaced uh, Josh Brown within six games of being in in uh, Arizona. That's no surprise. Kesselring's a really good hockey player, and Brown's kind of a seventh defenseman. Yep. So I, I, I'm not going to speak to Brown's ability. I yeah. I don't put weight in those numbers, Bruce. Th- those same mm-hmm. numbers, that same kind of analysis said. When Patrick O'Sullivan signed with the Oilers, that, that was a good move. When Benoit Pouliot signed with the Oilers, it was, he was going to push the river. When Mark Fain signed, that was a good signing. So I just... I just I'm skeptical of I that. I'd say of... Micah and Jay Fresh are long, several generations removed well, from those analyses of the last decade. I don't really know. Um, it's based on the same same idea Dr. of using on ice numbers. Came here in 2009. Yeah, it's based on the same on ice numbers. You know, team in play part, to bring yeah. an individual player. So I'm not saying I'm just saying for me, other people can mm. put weight. Other people can put weight in them. I'm just saying. I'm gonna to wait to see Josh Brown before uh-huh. I before I weigh in on I it. I can't because, wait. <laughs> okay, you can't wait. Maybe you're right. I, I, have, I you should come I, to uh, maybe and they could development right. camp so we can they get a look at right. I just think based on a number like that, like an on ice number, how the team did when he's on the ice, who's he on the ice with, who's he on the ice against. Mm-hmm. There's lots going on, and I know it's over. Like those same numbers also said Chris Russell wasn't any kind of hockey player. Well, Chris Russell was some kind of mm-hmm. hockey player. So I'm just, I just don't put the weight some people do. Put, uh, we'll leave it at that. And, the, and well, I'm not, he, he, he's no. big and tough. And the other com- really good comparable for these guys uh, is uh, Yanni Hockenpah, who signed two times 1.5 million today. So Vinny even outdid that guy by half a million. Wow. Well, year. he was hurt, so, of course, mm-hmm. Hockenpah. Yeah, he missed a series against Edmonton, thankfully. So he was one guy who was kind of on my list of, well, if they lose to Harney, who might come in and do a similar job. But anyway, he signed out east and uh, and Vinny signed out west and we got Josh Brown. We'll see if Josh Brown is a worse player than Vinny to Harney. He might be, he might not be. I just, I can't say because I haven't watched Josh Brown. Right. The key for me with the Harney versus... It's um, and I remember this. That we're gonna go way back here, but this is what we do at the Cult of Hockey. Um, I just remember watching the Oilers in the early '80s, and there was a defenseman called Doug Hicks, mm-hmm. who looked okay at times. It was a mm-hmm. pretty good player, put up a fair mm-hmm. number of points with the Oilers. Big then they clubs. got to the playoffs. They got to the playoffs, and I just remember him getting turnstiled again and again and again. And he wasn't on the team the next year. And that's how it works in the NHL. The playoffs, there's so much weight put in how players perform in the playoffs. And it's two years in a row now that DeHarnay started out on the roster in the playoffs and was taken off during the playoffs because he wasn't getting it done. So I, I think in the end, that's why he's, the Oilers decided they couldn't give him $2 million a year. If, if he had done so, they might have stretched mm-hmm. hard enough to, to get there if he had stayed in the lineup. But that didn't happen. So now they're going to try Josh Brown, and hopefully, fingers crossed, Josh Brown won't be like I don't know how good he is, but I this is a fairly decent top six they have right now, including Cody Cece, who is an underrated hockey player by many. I'm not saying he's a great NHLer. I'm saying he's an okay NHLer. Your third pairing defenseman is an okay. Your worst defenseman is an okay NHLer. Now he's overpaid. At you know he should be half that amount, but he can play hockey. And he and Kulak are a solid pairing. They weren't eaten alive against uh, the Florida Panthers. They were okay. I mean, Kulak had a bad moment on the winning goal, but we won't get into that again. Um, so and this CC is a good... crushed it on the penalty kill in the playoffs. All 54, season. Today. 54 minutes, zero goals against in playoffs. Yeah. All season, Bruce. Uh, Our great got a shutout. According to our analysis, he was their best <laughs> defenseman on the uh, PK during the regular season. And Ekholm was the best in the playoffs. Right. So um, I can see why they're like, I don't know how hard they're trying to move Cody. See, honestly, like they might be thinking if we can afford them, but we're not going to, they're, they're probably maybe thinking we're not going to eat. We're not going to take a poison pill to move Cody CC. Cause we don't, we think he can help us win. And it's not the, the trade off in terms of getting the extra money to sign maybe Adam Henrique or Matthias Janmark isn't enough 
to move Cody CC. Now we'd have to actually know what the trade off those trade offs might be and how much it would take to sign Janmark and Henrik, but um, we'll get into that. All right, the third trade is in net. Colin Delia arrives and Jack Campbell bought out and signed the new contract in Detroit. Good luck to Jack Campbell in Detroit. Nothing but the best. He struggled here, but you can see that guy was, <laughs> he was being eaten, eaten from the inside out about his play here in Edmonton when he was here. It was so hard to watch him struggle, but he turned it around in Bakersfield. He had a really good second half of the season and Detroit might have themselves one fine backup goalie um, this year, Jack them. Campbell. Yeah. One year NHL minimum because, uh, you know, Edmonton's paying him and he's just trying to get his foot in the door to reestablish himself at the NHL. It sounds like he's going to team up with Cam Talbot, uh, another former Oiler. There was ex-Oiler goalies showing up all over the place today, including two in Detroit. But Campbell's the one of most immediate interest because he's the one who was here last year that the team just made the big decision on that. They'll be carrying him for six years. And to say he was replaced with Colin Delia is a bit of a stretch in that, you know, we're talking about a completely different animal. One, yeah. one year NHL minimum two way contract for a 30 year old guy with 50 games in the league, uh, compared to the huge investment they made in Campbell just two years ago on this equivalent date, first day of free agency. Uh, so it's more of a, uh, just a, a reference frame of how far has Jack Campbell fallen from then till now. Third then, goalie in the organization. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Delia's, I think he's the fourth goalie in Delia, the yeah, you're right. behind Rodrigue as well as Pickard, of course, who is the, the de facto backup when they just signed Pickard, they already had just signed Rodrigue. And they let Ryan Fante go as a depth goalie, and they let, uh, well, they forced the exit of Jack Campbell, and so they needed one more goalie, and they got a depth guy in Colin Delia, who's played 52 in the NHL and 153 in the AHL, and he's 30 years old. Like He hasn't played that much, really, even in the AHL for the number of years he's been kicking around. He's been uh, mostly... He's there for depth and I think mentorship possibly for Rodrigue, uh, assuming that the Oilers can get him through waivers. Uh, the, the tandem in Bakersfield sets up to be Rodrigue and Delia. I, I can't see a scenario other than multiple injuries where Delia plays for the Oilers. Unlikely. Yeah, they also have a goalie called Connor Unger. I think Rodrigue yeah, they probably signed him. Oh, sorry. I think Rodrigue probably will will make it through waivers. Would be my guess, but you never know. Like sometimes they don't. Sometimes there's a team desperate for a goalie. Whatever happened to Vili Husso in Detroit? He has two bad years. I don't know if he's got. Oh uh, yes, season. yeah. I think he's still under contract there now that you mention him. So I'm not quite sure how that plays out. Like James Reimer. I don't know if he's a free agent or not either. He's, so. a, he's a free agent after this year because we were looking at him during the year as a possible. You know, when there was a goalie crisis in November, his was one of the names that was kicking around as a goalie on an expiring contract that might. Fill the bill. They did well. Man, Delia's got terrible numbers. Terrible numbers. Yeah. 900 career in the AHL. It's terrible save percentages. Wow. Why did, why did they sign him? Doesn't make any sense. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I do put a lot of weight in save percentage. <laughs> I have a few questions after some of these names that came oh, down the pipe today. Save percentage is a team based number, too, but man. Those are low save percentages. <laughs> 872 this last year in Manitoba, 32 games. Let me just see um, what the other goalies on his team had. Okay, he was at 872, and Thomas Milich in 33 games was at 900. That is a significant difference on the same team, I'm going to suggest. That's now another goalie had 12 games, and he was at 867. So the good news is, Bruce, they didn't sign Oscar's okay. self. 
Yeah. Oh my goodness. Okay. Um, all right. Anyway, sail on, McDuff, uh, Jack Campbell, and good luck to you. But unfortunately, you're just going to be a a, a seven figure dip into Oilers' salary cap for the next six years. So. Uh huh. And a permanent an stain on Ken Holland's reputation. <laughs> Yeah. And correctly yeah. so, he misjudged. Yes, fair enough. Yeah, if you're going to take the applause for signing Matthias Ackholm and Zach Hyman, you take the criticism for Campbell and Cassian and any other moves that went sideways. That's how it works. Yep. Um, all right, so the orders, Bruce, uh, going into free agency, we, I mentioned that there's this, they finally had a third line in the playoffs of Connor Brown, Matthias Janmark, and Adam Henrique. And my hope heading into this free agency period was that the Oilers would sign two of the three. And I thought that was, I, I just fingers crossed, and I still have fingers crossed. So Connor Brown signed a one-year deal for a million dollars, but Henrique, last time we checked, you just checking now, Henrique and Jan Mark, last time we checked, were still free agents. Now there was there had been some rumors, some kind of positive talk. It struck me before both before free agency and just today, like that Yanmark is going to get signed. That Yanmark is going to get um, kind of a two-year deal at a million two or a million three or something like that, and that he was going to sign. But that didn't happen today, not yet, and uh, we haven't heard anything from Henrik. But we Bob Stoffer did say that the Oilers possibly still hopeful about signing Yamark, possibly still in on Adam Henrique. What's your take? Yeah. Uh, two much hockey podcast reports. Interest in Matthias Yanmark is high as up to four to five teams are in on him, but it sounds like the Oilers remain confident in re-signing him. Adam Henrique might have priced himself out of Edmonton. Term team term isn't the problem. It's dollars. So, you know, they don't. How credible are they? Bruce? I'm not, I wasn't sure. I didn't really know that podcast. So I, do you know, like I couldn't, I didn't really know what to think. I saw an earlier rumor about something else and I'm not saying they're not credible. I just didn't know. Um, right. No, they're local guys that cover NHL, AHL, CHL, PWHL. Like they kind of cover the waterfront on okay. hockey. Okay. And uh, anyway, that's just what they they're may be, saying. They, and they may have some sources. We I have comments, know. you know, from, you know, Dustin Nielsen, for example. Hopefully the 1.4 for Perry has no impact on the ability to sign Yanmark. That would be a tough pill for fans to swallow, in his opinion. And of course, well, it's we'll 1.1 1. 1 for Perry, is it and not? We'll talk about Perry in a minute, but yeah. Yeah, it's 1.1 1. 1 for Perry plus bonuses. Plus if, bonuses. If, and we don't know what those bonuses are. Hopefully it's Edmonton Oilers win Stanley Cup and then you get collect your bonus. Anything... Yeah else not too acceptable not in, in 10 my games view. play david i should hope not i mean that's plenty for Corey perry anyway so um essentially we don't know about these these other two players what did Yanmark get four goals this year yeah but and he, he got also got four, four goals in the playoffs. In the yeah that's yeah. the four he so he got eight goals and the the final four were huge and his play in the playoffs were huge Matthias Janmark was a huge part of the Edmonton Oilers in the playoffs. Right. And and I guess you could hope, you know, he's getting a little older. And I guess what you could hope as well, if he moves on, the Oilers will sign the next Matthias Janmark. Right. That's the whole point of having scouts in an analytics yeah. department. Identify the 28, 29-year-old guy who's the next Matthias Janmark. Because so, Janmark is, what, 31, 32? So maybe he's going to move up. Maybe he's not going to be that player again. You just never know because players do drop off fast in the NHL. Mm-hmm. And um, man, he was good in the playoffs and he, that would be, it'll be, I, I would love to see him back. And again, as I, like, I know people are unhappy about Josh Brown and maybe, maybe those people are right about Josh Brown. I can't say yes or no, no opinion, whether they're right or wrong. Cause I can't say, <laughs> but he signed just for 1 million and yeah. Three years, you can sign, one, but one million. Yeah, he can play in the AHL for three years and not guys. make a dent. On the you can cap. sign 10 of those guys in the Oilers organization, all making a million. And I hope they do because they don't, like Yanmark last year, that's what he signed for. And and if you send him down to the, the minors, it doesn't count against your cap. 
So, and you made a list, Bruce. We were arguing with someone on Twitter about this, and you and you made a list of the guys Florida had signed in that in that range, and it was some really important players on the Panthers, including Kulikov, Kulikov and Stenland, and guys like that. Like, yeah, you can't well, compete without any. Like, I, I disagreed with that fellow's premise that yes. you know you need to have all three million dollar players. Well, sorry, if you got twenty three million dollar players, you got no room for stars on your team you have a 12.5 and a 9 and an 8.5 and you know whatever at the bottom end you got to have some you know you need four one million dollar players as opposed to another four million dollar player yeah and that was you better uh, hope your one million dollar guys can can survive out there and and uh, find a way to contribute and so that was Vance in, L- in L.A., Lethbridge, Alberta, who who we were arguing with. <laughs> and when you made that argument, he said, "I think he said I stand down." <laughs> so oh, okay, that was okay, a good argument. Okay. He that was well, a good argument. yeah, it, it it's a very valid argument in my view. Yeah. Anyway, uh, this is from um, David Pagnotta. Okay. It says Adam Henrique has generated a lot of interest, but nothing is imminent just yet. He's still evaluating his options at the moment. So here's my take, Bruce. This afternoon. I'm just guessing. I think the owners may be trying to move out some money. They might be trying to move out a player or two. And I'm going to say Cody CC, possibly. Brett Kulak, unfortunately, possibly. Ryan McLeod, possibly. Ryan McLeod, although, they, you know, again, they wouldn't want to lose his team speed. But they may be looking at something like that in order to free up money. And that's what the holdup in Adam Henrique and Yanmark to some extent might be. What do you think about that guesstimate? Yeah, well, I add the name Evander Kane to that list. Yes, fair enough. Because there's He's some been... smoke coming out that the Oilers and Kane are not on the same page, and that. Um, but he uh, has a no movement clause. He has a no movement clause, and I can't even buy him out if he's injured, which you know, he's injured. Uh, but there's. Um, you know, the team, uh, uh, when he voluntarily told the media just before the start of the playoffs that he'd been playing with his sports hernia all year, uh, that uh, uh, that sparked a lot of additional um, nastiness towards Ken Holland not managing his cap better and putting him on LTIR and, and uh, trading for you know, some $10 million guy at the deadline like Vegas does. Uh, uh, and, but the thing about LTIR is the player's got to agree to go on it. And we don't know the whole story behind the scenes, but uh, uh, it doesn't sound like the player and the team are on the same page. And unfortunately, when they needed him most Stanley Cup finals, he was too injured to play. And yeah. Yeah. Very got to be very frustrating if the team, you know, wanted him to go one way and get fixed up and he didn't, you know, then, you know, what's next other than they can't buy him out and he's got a no movement clause. Uh, so there's no sort of straightforward way to just move along from this guy, but uh, that's where these four year contracts for 30 plus year old power forwards can come back to bite you as we've seen numerous times in the past. So uh, Tim Peel, the former NHL referee said he spoke to Kane and this sounded a little bit of an, of an exaggeration that he said, he's talking about how, what players go through to get in the playoffs. He said he was taking like five, four or five, six, six shots. to eight. Six to eight Six shots a day. What kind of shots are these injections day. a day to play? Like, I, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe that's. I don't know any kind of shot that you need to take every three hours. I don't know either, Bruce. I'm not a medical expert, but. Neither am I. So maybe it's possible, but I don't doubt that we, we've heard that before that Kane was taking some kind of shots to play hockey. And no, listen. It's standard that somebody gets, a, you know, a I've, cortisone or, a, you know, yeah. a. But that's a game like day painkiller. Yeah, a I don't know. Game day. Here's what I would say about Evander Kane. I was close to running him off at the start of the year when he started out so crappy. Mm-hmm. And then a month later, he was their best player for for two or three weeks. And um was really good for and then he got banged up again. But then Bruce, I don't know if they get by the Vancouver Canucks without Evander Kane hitting Quinn Hughes 
and standing up to Nikita Zadorov. His contributions in the first two rounds of the playoffs against Los Angeles and Vancouver were outstanding. Vancouver. Especially, but LA, he had a game. He had one game, Evander King, where we he took over game that three. game. Yeah. yeah, he was. He got in a fight. He got an assist. He got a goal. He was fantastic. So yeah, he did get hurt. That happens to all kinds of players. It happens. Mm-hmm. To, it happened to Leon Draisaitl. It's not some yeah. a reason not to sign Leon Draisaitl right now. It's not yeah. necessarily because Kane got yeah. hurt. If he's healthy, he played well last year when he was healthy. So that's different. Still, so far to me, delineates him from Milan Lucic, who even when he was healthy, couldn't play. As far as I was concerned, couldn't play. So as a two-way player, he just wasn't up to it. Kane still is and was a good player when he was healthy. So, but there's enough smoke around here that sounds like um, the owners might be trying to move him. Now, I know there's lots, there's, there's still lots of people who don't like Kane mm-hmm. from his past and didn't yeah. want him to come to town. And I always wonder if, you know, they want to be proven right in the end, if he gets punted out of town we all have that in us right like the, you know once we've made up our mind about something it's hard to get off track i i was okay i was so and i'm the same way i was open to kane coming to edmonton here so i'm probably more open to defending him and seeing sure. i want to prove that i was right like we i think that's a a foible of uh of the human condition that we're all on that train track so but I, bottom line if players don't perform i'm not in favor of them and he, he did for me in the playoffs, I was impressed and I, and I thought he was good. And if he's healthy, that's encouraging. And I hope, and I don't know this, I hope there isn't really real problems with Kane on the Oilers. Um, some people are, go there pretty yeah. fast. And maybe, maybe there's, maybe there is, but I, again, I don't take any, anything around that issue. I don't, I've never seen anything credible yet about it that I think is for sure. Oh, this is a problem player on the team, on the, on the owners. Haven't seen it. one thing that I've put any weight on yet, other than just, just it's just, it's all just uh, chit chat at this point. So that's where I'll leave it. Yeah. Well, he, he certainly was in 2022 when they signed him for the rest of that season. He came in and made a big difference on that team. And it was great in the, uh, in the playoffs until he got suspended for that last game, you know, but uh, he scored 13 goals and led the NHL in, in goals that uh, playoff season. Uh, and uh, then they signed with the four-year extension, and that's, you know, he got hurt soon thereafter. And, you know, you can't yeah. say, you know, signing a power forward is dangerous because he might get stepped on by a skate. That could have <laughs> happened to anyone. And that was just horrible luck so early in that contract. Yeah. But unfortunately, it's not the only injury he's been dealing with. You know, whatever this core body thing is he had this year. But last year, he banged up his his wrist, I think, and his ribs. And, you know, it's just sort of your standard uh, aging power forward that doesn't, you know, bounce back quite the way that they did in their 20s. And, you know, you could cite a thousand examples of players of uh, that fall into that, uh, into that group. I'll just name a couple, James Neal and Zach Cassian, that the orders either had to buy out or they had to trade at a loss to get out of the last two years of their contracts. So. I will say my, my final thought is if you're, if you're, if you're complaining today that Evander Kane won't move his new movement clause, but you're also complaining that the owners didn't have enough toughness to beat Florida. Um, I just think you should think about those two positions and see if they align because they don't. If Evander Kane had been healthy against Florida, that would have made a big difference for the Edmonton Oilers in that series. It would have been fantastic. And it's too bad that didn't happen. But a lot of the Oilers were banged up. I mean, Dreisaitl was a shadow of himself in the Stanley Cup final. And that's just hockey. I mean, it's tough. And it's 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 not random because older players tend to get hurt more than younger players. But... Um, Take longer to heal. Yeah. All right. Noah Philp. This yeah. is really good news. The Noah Philp, um, former U of A Golden Bear, Western Hockey League player, 6'3", 200 pounds, right shot center, ripped it up uh, in the last half of the 2022-23 hockey season. He ripped it up in the American Hockey League for the Bakersfield Condors, I think was their top center for the last half of the year. And was we were thinking coming into this year before he announced his uh, retirement, what looked like his retirement, 
I think he was 26 at the time, that that he was going to challenge for the fourth line center job on the Edmonton Oilers. Every indication was that was going to happen. It didn't happen. And um, the Oilers ended up bringing in um, Sam Carrick at the uh, trade deadline to kind of fill that role. And they had Derek Ryan in that role. He, after a year off for personal reasons, um, he has decided to sign back with the Oilers. He announced that last March that he was going back to hockey. Ken Holland and the Oilers always made it clear that they were hoping he would come back to the Oilers, and he did, he's done so. He signed a one-year deal. So this is um, it's significant. What do you think of it, Bruce? Oh, uh, I'm very pleased that he's uh, coming back. I'm frankly not that surprised. Uh, even when he announced his retirement, there was some uh, tragedy in his life completely unrelated to the sport, is my understanding. And he took a year away from the game. And I always thought, you know, he might just be taking a year away from the game. And so last June 30th, even though his retirement was announced, Ken Holland took the very smart precaution of issuing a qualifying offer to him because he'd been a um, 24-year-old rookie uh, rookie pro coming out of the University of Alberta Gold Bears famous program. And so he only qualified for a one-year ELC. Like the the ELC length is based on how old they are when they sign him. The 24-year-olds get one year. So they had to qualify him. But his rookie year in in Bakersfield, he had like two goals at uh, New Year's and three assists or something. And then in in the 2023 part of that season from New Year's on, he had 16 goals and 16 assists, like his production, like quintupled. It was way better. And and so it was clear that he'd, you know, taken a little while to get accustomed to the pro game and was starting to thrive at it. And then, of course, the year off happened for him. And I would, uh, I would wager, if I were a wagering man, that when James Hamblin got called up this past season, that would have been Noah Phillips' job, yeah. uh, which he would have been, you know, more in terms of what they needed, big, right-handed, um, uh, and not as fast as Hamblin, but, uh, you know, with a different skill set that was maybe more in keeping with what, what they needed. So he, I, I'm almost certain he would have got a decent shot with the Oilers this past year and he might have just made the team stuck it they might not have bothered to trade for Sam Carrick you know because they had a guy that filled some of those uh, uh, you know checked some of those same boxes anyway I'm happy for him that he's you know seen his way clear to coming back to the game I'm glad the Oilers qualified him uh, last year the qualifying offer just simply stayed in place because he didn't either sign it or refuse it it was just kind of out there uh, but the fact that he signed this morning on the you know first day of the new season says he's raring to go and they've got him under under what seems like a reasonable deal for uh, you know take another fresh start at it and good luck to him. So the last member of the core 12 that isn't filled, if you're seeing the second line with Kane Ar- Dry- Drysettle and Arvidsson, which I am at this point, it's not Kane Holloway. Um, so. I mean, is third line center. So that's either going to be. Now, I heard people talking about RNH as third line center. I heard Bob Stoffer floating that notion as RNH as third line center. Maybe. Like, he's a smart, he's a good hockey player. It's a huge role on a team. He'd be outstanding. Like, he could be at the point of his career where that would be something he would commit himself to because he's on the power play, right? If he's, as long as he's still on the power play, gets some points mm-hmm. that way, maybe he'll commit himself to kind of a shutdown player um on the third line at center um i could see holloway getting a, a chance there although he struggled defensively on the wing so then there's mcleod right who's been auditioning for that role for a number of years maybe he's finally ready to grab it like full time and just hold it and keep it and um prove everybody he can do that so that's the last um position to be filled bruce i want to finish off Um, There's rumors that, uh, so Stan Bowman, Joel Quenville, and another uh, Chicago Blackhawk executive or coach, I'm not sure, um, they've been, the NHL has announced that that these people are allowed to come back to the NHL. They've been suspended from the NHL for, I think, two and a half years now Mm -hmm. because of their their poor response to the Kyle Beach 
um, situation where he was sexually abused by a member of the Blackhawks staff. I think their training staff or video staff. I'm not exactly yeah. sure. So um, they didn't respond in a, in, in a way that was deemed appropriate uh, by the NHL and they were suspended for it. The NHL has now looked at it. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, we don't know what Kyle Beach's position is yet on this. We haven't heard from him on it, have we? Apparently he spoke out in favor of Quenville, but I haven't heard anything specific to Bowman. This was something I read in passing and I have not seen like a statement or anything okay. specifically, but someone said, if you want to speak out for Kyle Be- Beach, bear in mind that he spoke out in favor of Quenville. I just took it at face value, which is always a dangerous thing to do on the internet. Needs verification. So you and I are, experts on this story let's start there <laughs> let's start there but with the and the reason the only we- reason we're bringing it up is because there's because stan bowman scotty bowman's son has been linked uh to the Edmonton oilers as potential Gross. gm so what did you Multiple what did you sources see david pugnata uh oh sorry ej Craddock. expect bowman to land in edmonton he says, expect. And who, EJ Herodic to, writes for whom? The NHL Network and NHL.com is EJ Herodic, and he's a long time. He's been kicking around oh, for yeah. years in the in oh, the yeah. uh, in the broadcast industry and in the media, uh, the hockey media. He so also says Mark Hunter might have a significant management role there as well. So for that I wasn't. Works. I wasn't putting a lot of weight in all the the talk about it until I heard that someone for NHL.com saying, I mean, there's mm-hmm. a special onus when you're writing for the league website yeah. to not say anything that that's going to tick off. Listen, Anybody. <laughs> many hockey fans, I'm just on Twitter right now. I see it already. Many hockey fans are oh. super upset about the, this idea. Almost, almost unanimous outburst from the Oilers uh, fan base. There's a Same. big outburst. Yeah, you'd have to do a poll to, to know what. And, and then on Twitter, it's it's different than the general fan base. The fans on Twitter are far more political and far more critical than the general fan base. They're far more critical of p- the players. I can assure you of that. Um, and um, so, yeah, no, it's 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 a different kind of person on Twitter. They're more in. They're just news junkies. Put it that way. And uh, anyway, um I don't know what to think about it, Bruce. I haven't investigated this. I, you know, one of the first things I would do is to to check out what Kyle. We should let's. I could try to do it in real time, but um, I'm just going to say that's out there right now. It's going it's being yeah. talked about, and um, people are going to have strong. <laughs> evidently, they're going to have real strong opinions about it. Um, Kyle Beach, Dan Bowman, what's your take? Well, it's a dangerous game. Anytime that you're um, risking alienating your own fan base. And, I mean, the Oilers have played this game before. I mean, this similar um, kind of outcry developed when the Evander Kane situation first developed in 2022. And there's still some fallout from that. I know some, especially some female fans that have, you know, Took that the took that hard and, and continue to to hold it in the negative column of you know the team and male uh, fans too like it's yeah yeah no I'm just saying especially yeah. so on the female side but yes some certainly a significant number of fans yeah and Kane you know I mean he's been from near as I can tell in Edmonton give or take this latest stuff that's coming out from behind. But what he's done in the community has been fine. He's been good with kids. He's done, you know, lots of uh, uh, promotion with the game and and stuff. Well, Stan Bowman is a guy who won three Stanley Cups with Chicago in the uh, first half of last decade. And then his team subsequently went downhill and into the tank. Uh, and not too dissimilar a ma- manner as what happened to uh, Ken Holland's Red Wings. And, of course, the Oilers went out and hired that guy right after. And it would be a very kind of Oiler thing. Uh, at the same time, it's not even the same guys doing the hiring, right? Like Bob Nicholson is uh, in, a, in a very, um, you know, not a central role like he was president of hockey operations. Holland himself is gone. Uh, you've got Jeff Jackson in there now that's that's running things. And 
apparently he likes Stan Bowman and you know I mean Bowman's bona fides with the game are are beyond I was gonna say beyond reproach other than clearly the Kyle Beach situation has led to plenty of reproach but in terms of his you know his I mean he's the son of Scotty Bowman his name's Stanley Glenn Bowman. He's actually named after the Stanley Cup because uh, he was born the summer after Scotty Bowman won his first cup. And his middle name, Glenn, is for the great Glenn Hall, Mr. Goalie, that still lives in the, age 92, I think, now out in Stony Plain. And, you know, I mean, everything about his name is hockey, hockey, hockey. He's just, um, he's got, you know, his own resume with the three Stanley Cups on it. So... You know, there's. You can see why he would be a commodity. People would want to go back to him and Quenville. I mean, let's face it, someone will hire Quenville. Someone already tried, and uh, now that he's apparently being, you know, served his time, so to speak, uh, from the NHL's uh, uh, persona non grata list, that uh, someone will hire him too. But it sounds like uh, a lot of people are connecting the dots, Bowman to Edmonton, because they have the. The opening at GM and you know he kind of fits the profile of experienced GM that's won Stanley Cups in the past that is looking for a good landing spot yeah so just a quick internet search and I can't find anything about uh, what Kyle Beach is saying I see he got he in 2021 he um, reached a settlement with the Chicago Blackhawks and that's as much as I can find out so far about what his position is on on all of this. So, and um, I mean, I don't have I don't have a position on it myself. I haven't looked into it enough to know anything to to, to comment on it um, with any kind of uh, credibility. So I'm just gonna hold my peace for now. And uh, and uh, I'll, I'll, you know, I understand that people would be upset, and I get I get that. But um, I w- I really want to dig into this a little bit more and and then have something to say, maybe or maybe not. Till he gets hired, honestly. Like, wow. like you know, July these 10th are credible rumors. July is but... the clearing date for whatever reason. It's not, I heard somewhere effective immediately, but the statement from the league specified after July 10th. So there's yeah. a few days. And hopefully the team at least is, is going to take the time to pay attention to what their own fans are saying. I mean, it, you can hire a good, good manager, but if it's a public relations d- disaster, is it worth it? You know, like there's there's several several considerations that need to be made. Yeah. All right. Any final thoughts, Bruce? Anything else you'd like to add? Or well, we didn't we didn't really dig into the Corey Perry contract, which is one year, one point one five million. Uh, so, uh, I wouldn't have signed him. Incidentally, <laughs> is the exact amount that can be buried in the AHL without penalty. One point five million can be. One point one five million. Well, one point one five million yeah, plus I... a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar bonus for we don't know what, but at least that we do know it will be kicked down the road to the season following. So next year his cap hit will be one point one five. And I was frankly surprised it was that high. I thought if they sign him again, it would be maybe a little above the minimum or one million tops. And so anyway, the, apparently he's very popular with the players and he certainly has game or knowledge of game. And the question is, does he have the, you know, closing in on 40 years of age, does he have the ability to execute the game that's in his head because the one in his head is quite quite superior. I have to say, I really enjoyed watching Corey Perry this year. Not sure how much he improved the team in the end, but watching him play was a blast. He's another player, person who came here under a cloud. You know, yep, it's, it's, um, there's been you a number of reputation and other team fans of other teams are saying, now nah, I figure it's Bowman to Oilers, you know, and, some of that we're just going to have to put up with. Yeah, in principle, I'm not against second chances. So, but that doesn't apply on every single case, which is why I'm not uh, right. talking about this particular case right now. Corey Perry, um, 
I didn't see it in the playoffs. Now, maybe he was hurt. Maybe the Oilers know he was hurt. But I didn't see a player who can help you win in the playoffs. So I'm not against these $1 million contracts. Maybe he's a player who can help you in the regular season. Keep everybody in line. Keep everyone on track. Help out in a few games. You know, play 30, 40 games. Uh, be a valuable player in those games. Uh, chew out Evander Kane on the bench, you know, once every mm-hmm. second month. Teach Ryan uh, McLeod how to play in the corners. Teach Ryan McLeod how to go to the net. I uh, hope they were all watching Adam Henrique in the playoffs. Um, yeah. so, so I'm not against that. This is, again, this is, a, you know, my blanket policy is a, the million-dollar contract. Sign them up. Mm-hmm. Bring them in. Line them up and see what you got. So he's in that category. But I'm skeptical about his ability to help the Oilers win a Stanley Cup in the playoffs. He should have been on the fourth line the entire playoffs, and maybe then it might have worked. And but again, I don't um, know if he was how injured he was or not. Um, and maybe he was significantly injured, and that really affected his play in the playoffs. Because, but it just wasn't there to me. So. Um, I'm not expecting much other than maybe a fourth liner who will help in kind of a Sam Gagne role uh, this coming season. Yeah, well, he basically took Sam Gagne's job away from him because he, yeah, he, you know, he ticked some of the same boxes. You know, veteran, offensive player, no special teams, so there's not room for too many of those on your bottom six when you got all your penalty killers there. And so when he came, Sam wound up, you know, in the press box and then in the minors. So it's, uh, but there is certainly room for a player like that on the team. And it sounds like they've made up their mind. They want Corey Perry to be that guy. They do. All righty, Bruce, let's leave it there. Thanks for talking today. Thanks for listening, everyone. And in the meantime, and in between times, this is another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast.